Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Beginner Breakdown. My name is always Alex Mollering and I'm excited to be talking with you today about our topic. There's been some major chess tournaments going on recently and something that I uh, get asked every now and again is, you know, I'll, I'll watch people uh, watching major tournaments and watching these professional games, grandmasters going back and forth and they'll, it's really impressive, it's really amazing to watch but people sometimes think, well, how am I ever supposed to get to that level or how am I even supposed to learn something from those games because it seems like it's so advanced and so today I want to try to answer that question you know what can I learn from master games how can I use those to help benefit my chess we're gonna look at at least one maybe a few games and kind of talk through this but I have a few suggestions right off the bat I want to give first one is you can do something called guess the move which is where you'll go through a game um, this is one we went through last week, but you'll go through a game and you'll get to some position and you'll think, okay, if I had the white player, uh, the white pieces in this position, what might I do? And then you'll submit, okay, here's the move I think I would try. And then you see what white plays, play d3. And if your move was the same, well, you played a move a grandmaster played. If your move wasn't, uh, then what I like to do is I'll just check it with the computer and see if the computer likes my move as well or less so and maybe look through some variations to try and figure out why. So that's one very solid way a lot of people like to do it. I think that usually works a little better at more advanced stages though um, because there's some really complex stuff going on in Grandmaster games and it's easy to get overwhelmed and just always miss it, especially in positions that are more complicated and don't lend themselves to one really good forcing move. So well, I'm gonna do this a little differently and you might have not done it this way, but I hope you stick with me. But my recommendation is we're gonna go through, uh, we're gonna start with one game and see where we go from there. We're gonna start with a game. This one was between Vasily Smyslov and uh, Josef Rudakovsky in 1945. So that's the master game we're gonna be starting with. And the method I'm gonna use, you can apply to any game. You could do it with your own chess games even or those of your friend, but I also think it's gonna be effective with master games. We're gonna walk through the full game, you know, kind of with brief analysis, trying to at least understand what was maybe the main point of some of these moves, but we're not gonna to get too deep into the analysis or the different variations. We're just gonna try to understand basically what happened in the game. If you were playing guess the move, you would prefer to go much slower and try and really dig in with your analysis. But here we're not gonna do that. We're gonna see the answers at the, before we have to take the test. Um, and then we're gonna go back through. We're gonna think what were the moments that stuck out, maybe moves that we didn't understand, or stuff we wanna just understand a little better. So let's take a look with this game. In the, the beginning, Vasily Smyslov played e4, and his opponent played c5. This is the Sicilian defense. Uh, the basic ideas, right for both sides, white's trying to control the center like normal, probably gonna develop some pieces, uh, try and fight for the center. Black is trying to fight for the center as well, but instead of doing it the classical way, uh, trying to put a pawn here in the center as well, Black's taken this flank approach, coming at it from the side, but attacking a center square, trying to stop white from getting that control. Knight to f3, controlling d4, adding a defender here, and e6. Kind of an interesting move, not seen as often today. Um, the, often the reason you're playing this move is because you want to add an extra defender to the d5 square. So now black is maybe looking to push this pawn forward. And it also opens up this bishop as a defender of the c5 pawn, if that ever becomes relevant. Pawn to d4, so white strikes in the center and black happily obliges. And both sides have some trade-offs here, right? We're gonna not get too in-depth with our analysis, but the trade-offs are basically White has great control in the center, this knight and this pawn. Black doesn't have as much control in the center, but they have traded off one of their side pawns for one of white's center pawns. So maybe in the long term, they can use these extra center pawns to try and gain a more long-term advantage. There's so kind of a short-term control versus long-term strategy going on here. Knight to f6, attacking the pawn on e4, and white plays knight to c3, developing, defending the pawn and pawn to d6. So this is uh, now the Scheveningen variation. You don't have to know a lot about what that means, but this is kind of a trickier line from black, a little more passive, but there's some uh, kind of ideas of preventing two early attacks from white. 
White continues with bishop e2, a natural developing move. Doesn't get too aggressive or out there, but looking to develop the bishop, gain some control, and probably castle the king. And black does the same, and we have castles, castles. Both sides are mostly developed. White has one bishop left to get in the game. Black has a bishop and knight. And let's see how they do it. Bishop to e3, makes sense. Knight to c6, putting some pressure here on the center. And white plays pawn to f4. Uh, looking to put more control on e5, right? This pawn adds a defender here, the rook behind it, so maybe looking to open up some attacks on the king side one day. Queen to c7. So now we can see the fight is more clearly over e5, right? White just played a move with the pawn attacking it, and black's queen move defends through the pawn to help that square. So both sides are trying to gain control here. And white plays queen to e1. A very subtle move, right? Anytime the queen moves, you always want to be watching out really carefully because they're such versatile pieces. In this case, we can pretty easily figure out the benefit, right? On the d-file, it was defending this knight, which was important, but the bishop is also doing that. But uh, it really wasn't able to do anything else. It was kind of locked in. Here on e1, it can't do much, but it can exit on this dark square diagonal and maybe put some pressure on the king side. So that's probably what white's looking to do. And here, black goes for a trade. Knight takes d4. White recaptures with the bishop, naturally. And pawn to e5. Striking at the center, getting a little bit of tempo by attacking this piece. White backs off. And here, bishop to e6 is played, developing the bishop. Uh, you might notice there's a question mark there. Don't worry about why that's a mistake. We'll get to it in a moment. White here continues with f5, attacking the bishop, gaining some time against it. And what is the bishop going to do? It could retreat, but then you might ask, well, why didn't it just go to d7 on the first move? So black instead decides to play bishop to c4, offering a trade. White decides to accept. Bishop takes, queen takes. And now white to move. Uh, this queen, again, we want to, anytime a queen moves, look out for what it's doing. It's putting some pressure on this pawn, but that's pretty well defended. Some pressure on e4. Maybe that's a little more important, right? The knight and the queen both attack, only the knight defends. So white doing, wants to do something to defend this square, and they do it with bishop to g5, which attacks the knight and also opens up the queen to add an extra defender to the pawn. Uh, okay, black continues, rook to e8, trying to centralize their rook, and white captures the knight okay bishop takes back and knight to d5 putting the knight on a beautiful square here in the center of the board where it controls a lot of space makes a lot of threats black backs off bishop to d8 not really uh, any other good spaces to put it you could try to maybe put it on g5 here but maybe it still gets chased away somehow so black just decides to bring it all the way back defend a lot of these squares from this knight White plays pawn to c3. When I first look at this, that move looks maybe a little strange. Only reason is, well, it's not really defended, so maybe white's just looking to keep it safe, defended by some pieces. b5, black maybe now trying to gain space and strike against the queen side. Pawn to b3, attacking the queen. She doesn't have a lot of places to go. Can't take this pawn because it's still defended by the knight and the queen. So the queen goes to c5 with check, and the king has to go hide. Rook to c8, lining the rook up with the queen and putting it on this nice semi-open file. Pieces generally like to be placed where they have the most space and options. And in this case, the rook, the fact that there's no black pawn anywhere on this row uh, in, or on this column in front of the rook means that it's going to have uh, more power and more influence on this square. White plays rook to f3, thinking similarly that uh, this rook wants to be a little more active than it was back here behind the f5 pawn, and now it's doing multiple tasks. One, it's defending this pawn from the attack, and two, it could also be looking to slide over to one of these files and put more pressure on the king yet again. King to h8, getting the king out of totally out of any diagonals, maybe wanting to push this pawn one day and step away from an attack here, uh, and just get a little more to the corner. 
Pawn to f6, looking to strike forward, break open this king side, and try and launch an attack. Black decides to take with the pawn. Uh, this seems like an important moment to come back to. What else could black have done? What's going on here? But black in the game chose to take with the pawn. And queen to h4. This is a pretty nasty move. Uh, we remember earlier on, queen was moved to e1 in order to develop uh, to the king side, and now we see it's ready to strike. Uh, the queen is putting a direct pressure against the king, lined up with him, and there's lots of threats, maybe threats against f6, threats of moving the rook over and getting a checkmate. So black has to be very careful to survive here. Rook to g8 with the idea of bringing the rook up to g7 to defend this pawn, which is basically what happens. The knight takes on f6, and the rook, which was attacked, now goes here to defend against the checkmate threat. Rook to g3, a really nice move by white. Looks like they're trying to attack this rook uh, and lure it away, right? Black can't just take because our knight and queen make a checkmate threat if that rook leaves. Uh, to get rid of that, black first plays bishop takes knight. Now you could take because the knight's not defending anymore. So queen takes f6. And we notice there's now a little bit of a problem for black this rook is now pinned. There's no time to take because the queen would then take black's king. Uh, there's also a checkmate threat, right? This rook and queen double attack this rook and you need an extra defender. So black shifts the other rook over rook to g8 and white now tries to find a way to end this game and does so pretty simply and effectively with rook to d1. The point here is going to become clear if you don't see it. And one of the benefits to a master game, and especially this method, is you don't have to see it because the masters might <laughs> play it out for you. Uh, black plays pawn to d5, kind of desperate to do anything. White trades the rook. And then uh, actually in this position, uh, black just resigned, I believe, with the idea that if they take back, the point is white will play rook takes d5. And attacks the queen threatens rook to d8 check uh, not quite checkmate because you can block um, but there's no good move here right we can imagine if black just tries to save the queen then this will be check the rook can't block because it's pinned so the queen will have to jump back and checkmate and even if you bring the queen to defend this right cover the square you can still just play rook to d8 because the queen will have to trade and it's not quite checkmate, but a queen versus a rook, white should have a fairly easy time cleaning up this game. Okay, that didn't take super long, right? We Maybe about 10, 15 minutes, something like that. But we got through a whole Grandmaster game. And you might say, well, that's great. But you, the teacher, were kind of walking us through it. And maybe you weren't seeing all the ideas I was explaining. And that's okay. It, the, these things take time. And having a teacher to explain the ideas is always helpful. But... Now that we've seen the game, even if you didn't really have all those ideas in your head, we can now go back with kind of the hindsight of what happened and take a closer look and try and analyze what happened, what specifically, what were the ideas, what worked, what didn't. And we can ask ourselves, how can I apply the lessons that happened here to my own chess? So let's see if we can work together and pick out some really important moments from this game. My recommendation when we look at the opening is uh, you want to be kind of careful, right? Because in an opening, there's a lot of theory, and especially the higher level you get, the opening is more and more just road mapped out as opposed to kind of intuitively felt. So there's kind of a danger of looking too closely at the openings because, again, theory is going to take over. The things I think you should focus on are how do each player do follow the three opening principles because every opening every good opening is going to be following those three what are they controlling the center so how are both players placing pieces on or attacking these four center squares uh, how are they developing their pieces especially the knights and the bishops because you need to get those out quick right if you leave your pieces on the back row they're not nearly as effective so how are they developing their pieces how are they controlling the center and finally how are they keeping their kings safe? Right, king safety, 
if you lose the game, it's because of a checkmate or a threat of it, or you resign because you're going to get checkmated eventually. The king is the most important piece in the whole game. And so looking at how both sides handle keeping their king safe in the opening is going to be really helpful. So I kind of talked through some of those ideas as we went, but on our second look round, we can see that both sides are doing something similar, right? E4 puts a piece on the center, attacks a center square, and it indirectly helps development by opening up lines for these pieces to emerge should they choose to do so. C5, again, fights for the center in a kind of indirect way. Not as helpful with development. Uh, it does help the queen get out. Uh, and subtly, it also helps this knight with development a little bit because now when the knight gets into the game, it won't be blocking this pawn, right? We can imagine if e4, or sorry, e5 had been played something like this. Uh, this is a fine thing to play, but notice that this pawn is now not as easy to get into the game. And so one of the benefits of the Sicilian is you avoid that problem. Now, whenever the knight jumps in, it's not going to be blocking that pawn. So you have a little better control of the center because of this pawn. Uh, knight jumps into f3, natural developing move. e6, and again, our expectation was probably d5. We learned later that's not actually what happened in the game. Uh, black played pawn to d6, so a little more passive, but still giving a little bit of room for the bishop to come into the game. d4, and it's hard for black to not take this pawn. If you let white kind of stabilize the center, stuff gets really hairy. Um, White could even back this up with c3 and always have these two pawns in the center. So uh, d5 is possible, but I think taking makes the most sense here. Knight to f6. Again, part of this is opening, right? It's uh, theory, but we can still break it down with the principles. This move helps every single principle. It attacks the center of the board, attacks a weak square. It develops a piece from the back row, and it clears room for the king eventually to castle. So it's helping in every aspect, even if we don't always think of it in that way. Knight to c3. Uh, similarly, just defending, uh, opening up space. We know white doesn't queenside castle, but it's keeping that option alive, potentially, uh, and just developing a piece. d6. Bishop to e2, again. Uh, we might ask, why didn't this bishop go farther? And again, this might be a more theoretical question. You could look with computers or you could find an opening book. And I, I, I don't study this opening particularly, so I'm not sure. In my mind, if we put it on c4, maybe we're kind of inviting black one day to play d5. I know they just played d6, but if my bishop is out here, it does incentivize black to kind of get back a free turn because I'm probably going to have to at some point spend time wasting a move by getting this bishop somewhere else. So maybe that's why you go here. And probably you don't go to d3 because you don't want to undefend this knight, right? Notice the queen online with that knight. So, you know, we can maybe try and work those out. But if you don't see them, again, the opening isn't where I would focus your energy when you're trying to learn from a master game. Bishop to e7, preparing to castle, and both sides castle. And at this point, we're not really out of the opening. We have one or two more moves where the pieces get developed. But once you have a good sense of where all of the minor pieces are going to be and where the kings are going to be located, I feel like that's probably when we have entered the middle game. It's at least a very good indication we're in that direction. So now, when we're in a middle game, you want to look at a few uh, different things, right? The reason the center is so important in the opening is because it's a great launching point for no matter where your opponent decides to play, if they're making a big queenside attack or if they're castling kingside and fortifying, whatever they do, it gives us time to kind of react and respond accordingly. Because you can imagine it's gonna be a lot easier, right? Say that my knight is here in the center. If I decide I wanna fight on the king side, it's gonna be easier for me to relocate this knight in this direction than it is if this knight's all the way on this edge, right? I could pile up all my pieces over here and hope my opponent goes on the king side and then maybe they castle queen side or maybe that's just not a good area for me to attack and I've wasted a lot of time. So putting stuff in the center makes it a great launching point for both sides of the board, gives me some options. 
Once we're in the middle game, the center is still usually important because it's still a launching point and you want to be able to have lots of versatility with your pieces. But we also now have a sense of some of the key areas to attack. Once you're in the middle game, you want to start looking for weaknesses. The king is kind of always a semi-weakness because it's the most important piece. So if you have opportunities to attack the king, it's a great place to start. And if you look at a position and just have no clue what you're supposed to be doing, looking at where your opponent's king is placed usually is a good indication of what you can start to do. Some of the other things you can look out for are where your pieces are placed, where you have more control. So uh, the pawns, right? If you have a pawn chain, sometimes that can suggest a direction to fight because you have more control in that direction of the board. Um, or if you have more pieces, like I'm noticing that these bishops are pretty versatile. They're kind of attacking on both sides. And so I get to make a decision of maybe where I want to orient them. So some of these things are for your consideration. And you can always look at, you know, weaknesses like double pawns or unprotected pieces. Anything that you think might give you a tactical advantage is a fair place to try and attack. So let's see, uh, in this position, there's not any clear, I think, tactical threats. So let's start to look at more carefully what happens. F4 is the move played by white. And I think this is a really interesting move because notice whenever you have two pawns in the center, uh, and even though you know it's not the actual center like d4, but it's still towards the center of the board, notice how much control these pawns actually exert because they look kind of you know normal just when you look at two pawns next to each other. And then you realize, oh, they control all of this space. That's four squares, right? That's basically half of the board. Um, in one row. You can say the same thing with these, right? They're more defensively oriented, but it's still a lot of control that these pawns are exerting. So there's a value to having space in that way. Um, we also notice that if we think back on what happened in this game, white made uh, some pushes with this pawn eventually, right? They pushed f5 and f6, broke through black's castle, they brought their queen over this way, their rook slid up and over. Um, and so we can see already from move nine, white is planting the seeds that are gonna let them eventually break through with this attack. So white, I think, had the same assessment we did, that there's not any clear weaknesses in this position. So building towards uh, an eventual plan to go for the king is gonna pay off in the long run. Black plays queen to c7. And Again, I think this move generally makes sense. They're controlling or fighting for control of e5 because you don't want to give your opponent just a huge foothold in the center. It's also putting the queen on this semi-open file. That didn't become majorly relevant later, but it was something noteworthy, right? This piece, once these knights kind of clear out of the way, the queen's going to have a lot more control uh, on this avenue of the board. Uh, and it's also, whenever you move the queen out, we don't like to move the queen out too early, right? Um, because if you move her out before a lot of these other pieces are developed, there's a much better chance that they can bring those pieces out with plans to attack, right? And the queen's gonna have to run around all over trying to avoid these trades, and your opponent's gonna get time to set up all their pieces. Once you see where the pieces are set up, right? Once we're in a middle game and most of the pieces are decided and you see where the kings are placed, you usually have a much better sense of how to pick a spot safely with the queen. So there are ways that white could maybe try to attack this queen, you know, maybe bringing a knight over. But black has accounted for those and is not worried that, the, in, that black is probably thinking these are going to be overextending. Queen to e1. Again, the benefit of hindsight in this game is we know what ultimately happens. The queen is going to jump out to h4 and put a ton of pressure on both h7 and on f6. So just keeping in mind just this one subtle little move and how versatile that was to help with the attack. Something, again, there's you can kind of try and do some deep analysis and then come back at the end and think, okay, what are the major things I looked up? You can also just, as you're going through, try and think of stuff you can take and apply to your own game. For me, something like this is once you develop your pieces, we can already start to say, how can I find whatever I'm fighting for, whether it's directly going for the king for an attack or picking out some other weakness, but how can I 
start to slowly maneuver my pieces to make that option more available depending on what happens. So this move is not committing immediately to a major attack on the king side, but it's putting white in a much better position to execute an attack on the king side if that becomes uh, an available or enticing opportunity. Okay, black's next move was to trade here on d4. And I put a little kind of dubious notation, this question exclaim, meaning this isn't necessarily a mistake, but it is maybe not the best, might be a little inaccurate. And let's think about why this might be. Well, my thought is this knight is not real. like the fact that it's fighting for control and putting pressure on the center is valuable. Giving that up, we want to get something for it. What is black getting? Well, they've opened up this line for their queen, which could be a little relevant. They've maybe opened up just this square, like if they ever wanted to move the bishop here, might take a little bit of time, but that's a possibility. Um, but really, I think the downside is it invites white to get a massive control in the center, right? This bishop now is a monster. And black's plan for this was to play e5 and shut this bishop down and win some time. And white then retreats. Black maybe wanted white to take here. Um, I think this would have worked out a lot better for black. This is probably what they were thinking is something like takes. And if white, you know, goes for some like kind of, there's some really interesting ideas, something like queen to g3 here, which looks like it gives up the bishop, but we want to be really careful about our pins. So our queen is now lined up with our opponents. And if they take, we can take back and we're putting the queen online with a king. So maybe black thought, oh, well, white might want to go for this idea. And black has a really solid answer with a counter pin of bishop to c5. Now, uh, you can't take this pawn. If you can't take it with the bishop, it's not legal. If you take it with the queen, well, uh-oh, you still can't take it back. So you don't want to, oops, you don't want to lose your queen. Let's get back to where we were. And to me, this looks like a really pleasant position for black to have, right? Something like this, where black is basically equalized. The center is really well controlled. Um, and I, th I mean, it's still a fight, but I think black feels very good here considering how they were a little more passive before. So being able to maybe facilitate something like this, in my mind, this is what black was thinking. They were thinking, we're going to trade these knights. And when the bishop comes out, we can gain time on it. If they try and trade, we're good. And if they back off, well, we're also fine. We have launched a pawn into the center. And I have, uh, I, I think this is kind of another key moment in this game because what black's plan here is just a little bit flawed. And the way white punishes black for this mistaken plan is just really brilliant and very subtle. Um, we looked at some of the moments later in the game with like queen to h4 and these like pins and checkmate ideas and they're really kind of fancy and pretty and helpful for tactical thinking but i think this moment knight takes d4 into e5 um, and then these following two bishop moves bishop to e6 and bishop to c4 are actually the only major mistakes black makes this whole game and i think they're the reason black loses so i want to take some time with these so what's really interesting is Black's thinking we have gained a foothold in the center and now there's a chance, now that this pawn is not on e6, right? the whole purpose is we're gonna develop this bishop. Where are we gonna put it? Well, they didn't just wanna put it here. You can't put it anywhere over here because white controls all these squares. So really the whole purpose of this maneuver, besides trying to gain control in the center, is to open up e6 for the bishop. Black's plan here, I think, was anticipating, okay, well, if they push f5, then maybe they have a little more control on the king side, but I have better control in the center, right? This pawn is a lot harder to contest now that white's pushed past and decided not to exchange. And Black thinks, okay, well, we can just trade these pieces and this is fine. But there's a few problems. I think 
probably Black should have just played for some quiet development. Um, there's a little bit of tempo wasted, right? This piece moves twice just to be captured once. So maybe a little bit of tempo. And I think the biggest problem is looking at the color complexes. This is not something that is always immediately noticeable when you look at the board. But if I'm looking at this position, let's look, uh, let's, I'm gonna switch it actually to Black's perspective. Let's look at Black's perspective. Which squares do we have better control of as the Black army here? And if you're in the audience or in the chat, feel free to leave some thoughts. But what, what do you think? Do you think we have a better control over the dark squares or the light squares as the Black army here? There's a few conflicting thoughts in the chat. When I look at this position, I think that black is not dominating, but pretty well controlling the dark squares. I see this bishop is kind of around holding everything together on the defense. This queen is lined up with this pawn chain, all of which controls dark squares. Right, the bishop threw it, the queen. Now, black controls some light squares, right? This knight controls a few. This bishop controls a few, but it's not really developed. I think black controls the dark squares much better. So it is an interesting decision when you control one set of squares and not the other to immediately trade away the piece that helps you control your weak points, right? If we flip this back, Black's decision is, okay, I'm gonna bring the bishop out. White now gets a foothold on the light squares, right? The knight, the pawns. So black's fighting on the light, or the dark squares and white's fighting on the light squares. And black decides to give up their light squared bishop, right? A real major contender for those squares. And it's now, even though black has a foothold in the center, there I think are two problems. One, there's this problem of, okay, White's already lining up to start fighting on your king side, and now you've just given them a foothold in that territory. And the second problem relates to this pawn on d6. This pawn is uh, what we would call a backwards pawn. What that means is there are no pawns beside or behind it that can help support its motion forward. So these two pawns are connected, right? You could move either one of them up, and the other one would guard it. So they're just connected pawns. Um, this is still connected, right? It's not isolated, it's not on its own. It's connected to one, but it's only on the defensive side because anytime it moves forward, it has to move through enemy territory and it doesn't have the defense of an extra pawn. This means it's especially hard to move forward and the square in front of a backwards pawn is really weak because uh, if there were pawns next to it, they could help cover the square in front of it, either by moving forward or just by being there. But because there are none on either side that are behind it, this square is really weak. It's also easier to attack. So it's harder to defend and it's harder to move forward. So backwards pawns are a bit of a weakness that we can try and exploit as white. And white does this in a really beautiful way, not by trying to win this pawn, but by trying to gain control of the light squares in a basically uncontestable way. Black did the hard part of trading off this light squared bishop, right? With that around, it's even though we can have better control, black still is gonna have a piece that's able to fight and kind of keep us off, right? Even if at this point, black decides just to back off, it's a lot harder for us to, you know, make really strong progress in this position because we have better control of the light squares, but anytime we try and invade, they have this piece that they can use to try and repel us. Once this piece is gone, we have the opportunity to invade in a way that black just can't deal with. And so we know that there's this kind of nice square. Uh, yeah, so someone in the chat pointing out, we also have a backwards pawn um, on e4. That's true. And black's plan here, we notice they try and attack it. Um, but the reason I think this one is more important is because there's the semi-open file. 
So ours is stuck behind a pawn. It, it's not moving anyway. So as long as we can keep it safe, we're good. But this pawn actually would like to move forward and we can deny that and put pressure on it. But white actually, again, goes a different way, not just in the attacking means, but white decides to take advantage of this square. Because black has no light squared bishop, and because there are no pawns able to defend this square, if we can get a piece placed on this square, it's going to dominate. And as we already saw from this game, the piece that eventually ends up here is this knight. And we get an outpost, where the knight is placed on this beautiful square and control so much of the board that it's very, very hard to contest. The question is, how do we do that? Well, it's very simple. We have to get rid of the pieces that can take it. In this case, I mean, the queen can always take, but you're never trading a queen for a knight or something, so we don't have to worry about that. And a rook sometimes will take, but that's always them giving up an exchange. The only piece we really care about here are the pieces of equal or lesser value. Well, we know the pawns can't do it. There aren't any there. The bishop can't do it, it's on the wrong color. They needed a light squared bishop and they traded it away. So this knight is the only piece in our way. And so white very quickly and efficiently finds a move that deals with both problems. The problem of this pawn, we move the bishop so it's defended. And the point is we're not just trying to defend, we actually just wanna take this knight. It's a really kind of uh, fascinating thing. It's just so simple, but once we get rid of this piece, our knight just comes in and we're doing really well. Black plays rook to e8. The problem, if, if they try and, I mean, black just can't afford to not trade this piece, right? If they move it, well, this bishop isn't defended by anything, so we're just going to win that piece. So black tries as quickly as they can to get out of this problem, right? Now the bishop's defended. Now their next move, they're probably going to run away if they get the chance, but white doesn't give them that chance. We take. Bishop takes back. Uh, you could take with the pawn, but again, if black's trying to keep their king safe, we don't want to open up this attack. We already know white wants to do that. And also, this is maybe the worst bishop I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> it's, I would call this piece a tall pawn uh, because unfortunately, it's just not doing anything. So yeah, you probably have to take with the bishop. And now white has this opportunity to jump in and it might not have been obvious in the game because it didn't last super long. The knight jumps into d5 and then makes, uh, it eventually traded off for this bishop uh, and I think it traded off for this, it traded off for something over here um, and kind of ruined black's pawn structure and white was able to carry out the checkmating attack. But if we spend some more time and look at this piece, we can realize just how devastating it is. So this knight is really kind of, one, it's occupying a square that can't be contested, we know that. It's also just denying anything this bishop could ever hope or dream. Because it controls virtually every square the bishop does, right? The bishop gets two extras, this one and this one, our queen controls here. So. Our knight is basically just dominating this bishop, and in doing so, it's also cutting off the rooks, right? They're not connected to each other anymore. If you don't put this bishop back here, then black also has to be afraid of possible knight forks, right? This looks really juicy, so you have to be careful of that. Um, and they also have to be careful of eventually, you know, the knight coming into f6 and messing with the king, if that's ever an opportunity. So this bishop is just so overworked. This knight is really putting in some overtime here. Uh, and there's also an interesting moment where white, black could try and take this pawn, and instead they chose to back off with the bishop. Now maybe they didn't want just a trade, and maybe you could make an argument for that. You know, black has won a pawn, but their king is exposed. Um, but we have traded off a lot of firepower. It's possible, even if black goes and hides in the center, we might just not have enough to finish off this game. So, yeah, I'm not sure that that's fully the reason. But actually, if we take a closer look, this move is unplayable. It is white to move. Because this is a variation, I'll let you try and take a stab at it. But see if you can figure out why queen to uh, c2 winning the pawn is just not very good. It has to do with our beautifully placed knight 
and how we can take advantage of all of our threats. But how can we punish this queen? So a few people are on the right track in the chat um, with the idea that, okay, we notice that the knight wants to go to c7 and get a fork. And we have this idea of playing rook to c1, which attacks the queen and defends that square. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here, because I think if we play rook c1 uh, right away, there I think there's a slight problem. I want to try and remember exactly why. But the, the, this I think this might work, but it might be a slight inaccuracy. Maybe it's just they take enough material down with them that it's not as good. So the, the more precise way to start is with rook to f2, because now we're going to defend all of this. And the problem for black is there's actually just no way to like avoid this problem anyway. Right? Uh, because where can black safely move? If you go to say a4, well, that's great. Now we don't have rook c1, but we don't need rook c1 anymore because the queen's not defending this square. So we can just get the fork. So the queen has to stay on this line and you know wherever it goes, rook c1 is still following and we can still follow with this idea. So you had the right idea uh, with this. Yeah, this uh, black is just too exposed here. So even though that threat never came up in the game, it's something that where we can plug it into a computer or you know have uh, like someone do some analysis or commentary on it and try and figure that out. We can see that this knight is applying tons of implicit pressure even when it doesn't actually come up in the game. So the bishop goes back to d8 and white plays a really subtle move. And something so nice about this game is notice that there's, I, I don't think there's any sense of urgency from the white player from this point on, maybe in the end with a few tactical ideas. But it feels like white is just kind of taking it slow and steady because black has no threats. All of black's pieces are kind of tied down defending important squares. Uh, the only piece that's really free to run around is the queen and she just doesn't have anywhere good to target. So white can just really slowly consolidate their position, make sure that there's no weaknesses in their defense and then press on for a victory. Right. Black tries to make something happen by pushing forward on the queen side. B3, very simple, just attacking the queen, keeping everything safe. Check, doesn't really matter. We have plenty of time, so the king steps off to the side. Rook to c8, again, just trying to make something happen here. But with this knight, there's just never really any threat. I mean, maybe you can try and activate the bishop, get some more pressure, and white just kind of denies this with rook to f3. Um, in the chat, somebody wanted rook to f3 we played earlier, but again, kind of the nice thing is with this knight just so firmly planted, all of black's pieces are being used for defense, just trying to keep everything safe, and there's just no need for us to feel any urgency. Um, black here plays king to h8, and white plays f6. Now, this is kind of a harder moment to find, I think, if you're playing on your own. But we can understand having seen the game. Again, White's point is just let's devastate this pawn structure. And to me, something instructive about this is to realize the point isn't to make these doubled pawns. Right? I think some people might say, oh, well, you've made doubled pawns and you've opened up a line. I think a big part of the point, too, something nice about creating a gap in your opponent's you know, castle is that this pawn now is very hard to defend. Before this move, if we execute our idea, right, we can't do it now because of the bishop, but like, uh, whatever, give us five moves or something. If we execute our idea of the queen and rook on this line, you know, maybe white can, or maybe black can just play h6 and hold for a while because they have pawns defending. So we see very concretely one of the benefits to breaking up the structure is the pawns just don't defend each other as well. So this is really nice. Something we should do, again, when we're looking at a game and we want to understand an idea, you might say, okay, well, black just kind of made it easy on white, right? They, they took this pawn and everything falls apart. What if they play g6? Why not just do this? And now if you go for your attacks, maybe just like h5 and, you know, the pawn's still defending each other, it does not solve the problem. Well, let's take a look. What 
uh, what might be wrong with this plan? How can white continue here to try and... Yeah, somebody already commenting, there's just way too many holes. This position is like Swiss cheese. There's just a massive weakness on this square, uh, and it's almost impossible to defend, right? This bishop, like if we're looking at which piece is more uh, effective in this position, right? This bishop needs to control this dark square and this dark square because this one is, th there's maybe a mate threat if we can ever get our queen over to g7. And e7, maybe we our knight can get in somehow and we can make lots of threats. So this bishop just, and it can't do anything. It's totally tied down by this pawn. The king, we have uh, locked down fully with our pawn. So this is, yeah, really hard to defend. Um, people are suggesting a few different things. Some people want to sack a rook, uh, which I think we might do in some variations. Some people just want to push h4, h5 and start launching down. h4 I don't like as much because I think it is met with h5. Um, and maybe it's a little harder for us to invade. One, there's, I, there are a lot of ways to win here, right? The nice thing is everything is fortified on our side. We have no weaknesses. It's just a matter of time and applying the right pressure. But one line that I think looks really nice is something like queen to h4. The point is we're going to go to h6 and to g7 with checkmate. If you try and stop me with h5, I'm just going to go to g5 and h6 anyway. And if you stop me again with king h7, now I can just sacrifice material. Um, maybe I can play like g4 and just take stuff. Um, you can just very simply play rook h3. And there's a lot of pins in this position, right? Now, uh, if black just does nothing, our threat is just to take. Because if you recapture, then queen to g7 is checkmate. And if you don't recapture, my queen's coming in and winning the game. Um, so if you try and stop that with something like rook to g8, now if I take this is defended, well, the problem is I can just take it anyway. <laughs> because now if you take, your rook has covered your escape square. So it's checkmate. So black's king is just kind of falling apart no matter what they try and do. Um, g6 looks like it's solid. Uh, it looks like you're holding stuff together. But we've noticed that, yeah, there's just so much room that black is now opened up for holes and attacks in their position that it's not really tenable to try and defend something like this. Um, even though this looks really scary, this was actually the better option for black probably to try and get some fighting chances. Because even though it's harder to defend this pawn, well, at least maybe we have an open file. Maybe there's some counterattacking possibilities if our opponent makes a mistake. So that's, I think, a better fighting way. Queen to h4, and rook goes to g8 to play defense. There is another really interesting move in this position that I think is worth looking at, and it's what if f5 is played? The point here is the bishop attacks the queen, and we leave the question of, okay, well, white, what are you doing? Because if you give me enough time, maybe my bishop can defend these dark squares, and I can still slide my rook in and survive. Again, there's a few different ways to handle this position. Um, and since the variation is in like critical, uh, I won't make you try and guess it because there's a few other points I want to kind of harp on. But I think one really nice move here is still to play knight to f6. Normally we would want to just let the knight sit and enjoy what it's doing. But here there's actually a nice opportunity because if you take, and you have to because my threat is checkmate, and there's no move that stops that besides the take. I, I guess you could sack your queen, but like, there's no serious try. Queen takes with check, and now we have a nice forcing sequence. The king's gotta go to g8. We can bring in our rook with check, more attacks. Uh, the king goes to f8, only move. We can slide the rook now down to g7, where it's threatening mate again. Uh, you have to defend this. Maybe you can bring this rook up, but let's say something like rook to e7. And white, again, there's lots of different ways to try and win here, but something very, very simple is to just take the pawn. And your point is you're going to come down with a back rank threat. Black can try and run away. 
but eventually you're gonna run out, right? In this position, we can get a nice skewer and forcibly win the piece. If you try and block, this doesn't work because now you're not defending this pawn. And eventually the king's just gonna fall. We're gonna get at least a rook, probably more. And the, the point isn't necessarily the variation, but just kind of the idea that um, we can cash in this really powerful piece in order to get our pieces that much closer to remove this critical defender of the dark squares. And once this king is on the ropes and our pieces are calling check and check and check, it's just very hard to get out of. So f5 doesn't work. Um, and that's something you could explore if you thought, well, wait a minute, uh, what if they played that? You can look with a computer and try and find some of those ideas. Rook to g8. And now we saw again White's really beautiful forcing idea of knight takes f6, very similar to what it was before, um, trying to force this, this trade eventually and just gain so much control because once all these pieces are locked up, then White's going to have free reign to finish the game. The rook jumps up. Uh, and if the bishop takes, then it's very similar, right? This is going to end up with something really similar to what we saw in the game. Right, and we can continue with these kind of ideas. <laughs> Nothing really is going to change too dramatically. So instead, rook g7 and rook g3. Right, the threats are this still active mate threat, taking uh, just, yeah, a lot to, to deal with. And black eventually just kind of crumbled under the pressure. There wasn't really anything too much to do. But the fact that we can exploit these really nice pins that Black's king is totally locked down and has no good ways to escape. And uh, the fact that, yeah, just all of these threats were really masterfully mined by white. And what's so funny here is with rook to d1, we notice that everything now kind of comes full circle. And this backwards pawn is now the final uh, way that we can break through. Right? We take the pawn. There's not a good way to defend it. And then the rook comes through to the end. Uh, in the chat, you're also saying, yeah, you can just kind of run the pawn down. Um, yeah, this might work. Maybe like h5 or something can block. I'm not sure. But there's a lot of winning ideas here. So when we have looked at a game like this, maybe the only other line we're saying is, yeah, like this also wins. White decided to take this first. But you could also take on d5 here. Um, the only downside is now the queen can back up and it's a little harder to break through this fortress. You can still do it, right? Rook takes, queen takes, queen takes. We, we can break through enough to get some advantage, but we've turned a, basically a checkmating attack into we have some extra pawns, we're going to win in an end game. So you can try that, but I like the way white played it of removing the critical defenders first. Okay, but back to our original question, which was, what can we learn from this game? I, I think there's a few things to keep in mind. And, and again, the, it's not just from this game, but really I want you to take the lesson of what can you, how can you approach a master game and learn something from it and apply it to your own game, right? We've talked about a lot of ideas with this game. In this one, we talked about fighting for the opening, right? Uh, how to control the center, how to, you know, leverage your uh, control, especially the color complexes. I think that becomes important as we move into the middle game. We looked at the value of controlling lots of space with the pawns, right? Why it's so important to try and have your pawns move forward and work together. We looked at the value of kind of more subtle moves, like lining up the queen to eventually attack on the king side and how to make a plan for which side of the board to attack. And then we talked about why Black's plan here wasn't so good. We said their plan of, you know, getting some tempo, trying to gain control in the center, was effective only if White decided to capture. So this is another important thing that I think beginners can really learn from a lot, is sometimes you get kind of in like a tunnel vision of a variation. And you say, oh, well, if I do this, they do this, I do this, I do this. And you're looking at very forcing moves. Sometimes it's okay to think, well, what if they just retreat? What if they don't take? 
What if they step out of check? Um, and thinking of some of those more simple options, sometimes they're also effective. And this is something that even grandmasters, as we can see, fell into. Now, in this case, I'm sure that uh, Rudikovsky here planned for what White's going to do, but his plan involved uh, getting this bishop into the game. He didn't like that this piece wasn't developed. He wanted it out of the way to make room for the rook. And so he thought, well, let's just trade it off. Won't have to deal with it. And that's okay too. Maybe the lesson with the piece, the mistake here and the, the value of pieces is to look at which pieces and which colors do you control, which, piece, uh, which color complexes do your pieces control, um, and how can you, you know, use some for offense and some for defense and balance that out? Which ones can you afford to get rid of? And then we spent a good amount of time as well looking at this outpost, right? This whole weakness, this backwards pawn that is created when white refused to take back, is now the long-term weakness that basically costs black the game. Because white can slowly but surely trade away everything that controls this square, place a really valuable knight on it, and cash that knight in when the moment is right. But until then, just put lots of pressure on the position. And in the very end, eventually swing this rook over and use it to break through and be the final kind of winning touch. So thinking about, I think an outpost is like especially useful. Thinking about how you can make your knights really valuable is, and we can imagine, right, after rook to e8, I think a very normal move in like a, in a beginner intermediate game would be just to immediately place the knight in the center. Put a lot of pressure here. Uh, this unfortunately loses because after knight takes d5, you think, oh, well, I'm attacking everything. I'm going to get something back. But if you take the bishop, the knight gets out of harm's way. And somehow black has done a magic trick where they take two of your pieces for one of theirs. And the same thing happens if you take the knight. So uh, it's very easy to get a little antsy with your plans, but just taking time and for planning to say what is the obstacle? What's in my way? How can I get rid of it? And how can I, you know, execute this? How can my opponent stop it? And just taking a little more time with it. And finally, once White was in this winning position, I think it was also really critical that White didn't just, you know, blow it away, make some crazy sacrifice and try and win too aggressively. White fortified their defenses, saw what was the weaknesses in their position, how can I resolve that? And then slowly but surely improve their position into a win. So no need to rush when you are doing well. When you're winning in a position, take your time. Don't just you know, throw it away. These are the kinds of lessons that I think we can learn from master games. And the, the lessons are going to vary from game to game, what's important, what sticks out. But I think this process, if you've never done it before, feel free to try it with some other games, other master games, ones you've looked at before, ones you haven't, ones you've heard of. Look through the game, go through it all the way, try and figure out the basic idea of, okay, what's the point of these moves, but don't go super in depth. Once you've seen it, once you understand, okay, here's what happened, here's how it played out, go back through, take a little more time, maybe work on it with a friend, use a computer, and try and understand, okay, what really happened? Why did one of these masters win or lose? Where do I think they went wrong? Where does the computer think they went wrong? And what can I take from that to apply to my game? doesn't have to be profound, doesn't have to be a lot, right? I've given us a lot of options to think about for lessons, but my recommendation for you would be to pick one, right? What's the one thing that you can take and apply to your chess? So maybe for me, it's, I really want to look at these outposts and say, if I have a chance where I see a backwards pawn and I have a knight that could land there, how can I get rid of the opponent's pieces? That could be mine. You can pick something else that's totally up to you. But finding just one thing you can take from a game, look at how the GM did it, and try to ask yourself, how can I do that in my games? I think it'll help you, and hopefully this lesson has helped you feel more comfortable at learning with the masters. My name's uh, been Alex Mullering. It's been awesome to work with you today. Hopefully you stick around, because right up next we're going to have our Grandmaster Benjamin Bach here to do Grandmaster's Choice. So please stick around for that. Thank you for listening, and have a great night.